Well, good morning. I, I want to talk with you a bit this week about uh, cognitive topics related to development in early childhood. Uh, as we begin to look at children and how they change between the ages of three and six, we're immediately taken with their richer cognitive life. Uh, they're more imaginative, they're more creative, they're more playful, they engage in language use more and with more fantasy as well. Uh, and uh, any parent of a preschooler or anyone who works with preschool age children is inevitably taken with just how, uh, how much fun it is to talk and interact and play with young children. So I want to talk about a few cognitive areas with you and touch on them with you today. The main one, I think, in reading in your text to come back to again is the work of Piaget. Um, Piaget described this period as pre-operational. That is, in a way, before the use of logical operations for making sense of the world. Doesn't mean that children are irrational, but it means that they base their understanding of events in everyday life on something other than logical reasoning or propositions. So what do they base it on? Well, first of all, uh, primarily, they base their understanding of things on perception. Things are what they look to be. Um, a four-year-old might get scared at Halloween when uh, someone that they know puts on a costume and a mask because they now think that that person has become that monster as opposed to simply playing at being a monster or putting something on. Things are understood based on how they look. And the ability to follow change, uh, what Piaget called transformational thinking, is limited as well. So that when something changes, it becomes something else. It's not the same thing in just another form. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, for you and me, if uh, I asked you for change of a dollar and you gave me four quarters, we would know it was the same, wouldn't we? But for a young child, if you ask, uh, uh, would you like one of these or four of those, you know, one dollar or four quarters, they might pick the four because there are more of them. Uh, what they see is what determines what they believe is real. So the perceptual nature of thinking uh, is an important characteristic during this period. Another related characteristic is, particularly for children three and four, Piaget would say, is that thought is intuitive in nature. That is, children come to conclusions based on what they sense to be true and not what their reasoning leads them to be true. Uh, if they, for example, notice that when they're driving in the car, uh, the sun seems to move along with them and keep pace, then they assume that the sun is moving and keeping up with them. And when the car comes to a stop, guess what? The sun stops as well. When they look at clouds in the sky, and notice those clouds moving from place to place, they may think that those clouds are motivated by a desire to go from one place or another, as if they had human motivation or will, rather than the laws of nature pushing clouds along. When they look at uh, shadows and say, why does my shadow grow and shrink? Well, it's because it wants to. It's not explained by some scientific or physical phenomenon of blocking a light and your relative position to that. Well, Piaget and his colleagues did a lot of studies in the 40s and 50s in particular on the child's conception of time, of space, of number, of causality. And a lot of these studies, as they got translated into English in the 1950s and 60s, influence developmental psychologists and cognitive psychologists. You could still find in print copies of those studies if you are interested in reading some of the books that Piaget and his colleagues put out on their research. So 
Preoperational thinking is perceptual and it's intuitive. It's at the same time symbolic. That is, children are beginning to replace interactions directly with things with symbolic representations of those things. You see this a lot in children's play where an object becomes something else and stands in for the child uh, and in the child's mind for the real thing. And particularly as children get older in this period, four and five and six, you see fairly complex imaginative play and dramatic play and pretend play in which as the child becomes to accommodate to the differences between play and reality, their play becomes richer. They can make believe that they are something that they know they're not. So for young children, the difference between a symbol and a real thing is at first rather unclear. And gradually the distinction, for example, a dream is, is something that takes place in my head and is not something that is really happening. Uh, or uh, if I say that I want something, that's not the same as getting it, right? In other words, gradually children begin to be able to distinguish their symbols for things and the real things themselves. But through much of this period of time, uh, that's not the case. And uh, children may think that if they, if they say something, it's the same as making it happen. Uh, if they have an imaginary friend who did the things that they did, then they themselves didn't do them. You know, they'll have these kind of, what to us seem rather illogical uh, conclusions, but in their minds, they're not so illogical. The last example of this I want to give you is what Piaget called egocentrism. It's a kind of self-absorption or um, an inability to see things from perspectives other than one's own. What that means is it doesn't mean that children are not empathetic or sympathetic emotionally of others. It's rather that they, the way that they see things and make sense of things, they assume is the way others see things. They have trouble knowing that other kids or other adults could have different opinions or perspectives than their own. So if they go to somebody's house and they're playing with a toy and it happens to be the same kind of toy that they have in their house, they want to bring that toy home because it's theirs. And if you say, no, no, you have yours at home, this is this, is this other kid's, they'll say, no, this is my toy. And you say, well, you didn't bring it. They have the same one. They won't get it. They think it's my toy. I'm playing with it. I'm going to bring it home. And it can be upsetting to them to leave something behind as a result. Egocentrism has a lot of consequences. Uh, children have difficulty in this period of stepping outside themselves and looking at things from multiple dimensions. Uh, they may not understand how they can be a little kid and a big kid at the same time. They certainly would have trouble understanding how someone could be a son and a father at the same time. They have difficulty realizing that you can be multiple roles, fit into multiple classes, uh, and shift around uh, simultaneously. This comes out a lot in the language difficulties children have, which is sort of the last thing I'll talk about today. On the one hand, children's language just emerges incredibly rapidly between three and six. By the time they're six, they're fluent language speakers with sentence structures, uh, grammars, and sentence lengths that are applicable to adult speech. They also have very large vocabularies. They come into this period with vocabularies of a few hundred words. And by the time they're six, they have, oh, five to 10,000 words. But they may use words inappropriately uh, to mean things that they don't mean, or they have trouble with certain kinds of word processes. For example, they may have trouble with comparisons, little, big, up, down. All right? uh, they may have trouble with um, words that relate to things like time and space. How long is a day? How long is a week? How long is a month? Now, to us, these are objective categories. We know what we're talking about when we say, oh, Christmas is, what is it, uh, six to eight weeks. But to a four-year-old, uh, the notion of weeks and multiple weeks doesn't have that same referential meaning. What might have more meaning is, well, Christmas won't happen until it starts snowing. <laughs> 
Of course, if we get an early snowstorm, they might think that Christmas is going to be right around the corner. So you have to be careful you know, when you ground things in a perceptual world. Uh, language, because it is symbolic, often presents uh, complications for young children. And you really can't simply assume that they mean the same things you do by their words, nor can you assume that they understand things the way that you understand. Uh, last thing on this, and then I'll stop for today. Many people say, well, how do you talk to children? Do you talk to children about events in their lives? And I, I kind of think you do. Um, but it's always good to start with, number one, being reassuring, and really number two, maybe number one, asking children what they think first. Don't assume that you know what they're thinking because their thoughts and the way they understand something may be very, very different from the way that you and I do. But you can engage young children in conversation and then use that as a way to sort of correct or reassure in a very specific area. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, children's big questions, where do I come from, what happens when somebody dies, are really smaller questions about, are you there for me? Can I depend on you? What will happen to me that can be more easily reassured? Well, uh, again, just to review, we've talked a little bit here today about pre-operational thinking, in particular about egocentrism, symbolic thought, uh, about perceptual thinking and the like. Um, you'll find these topics and others in this chapter. Good luck with your readings. Take care.